Um, and so I teach physics and astronomy at Western Washington University, but I'm also the halftime like inclusion person for our college, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. I also have a podcast. We have our Twitter handles up there, and they're in the order of that we'll be speaking in. So if you actually want to find us on Twitter or um, you're kind of live tweeting, that might help. Um, so first of all, you saw a lot of titles that I like things I do, and everything that I do is kind of related to this goal. So I kind of want to dismantle the scientist stereotype. And um, Dr. Rochelle Berg kind of, Berg's kind of talked about, is it Burke or Burke? Burke. Um, I talked about this, this idea of the scientist stereotype. And I want to just take a second to break down what I mean by scientist stereotype. So when I keep on referring to it, you know like how I'm kind of breaking that down. So basically, um, I'm going to scoot this just a little this way. Um, so basically, you know, what do they look like? Male, white, lab coat. Like, that's basically what she sh showed in the, in the lunchtime. Where do they come from? The US or Europe, and they had scientist parents. And I throw this in just because when I was an undergrad, I remember talking to all the other physics majors, and they'd be like, yeah, because isn't your dad an engineer? And I'd be like, no. So, um, or isn't your mom a teacher? Um, so it, it seems to be like this. The more academics you, you meet, the more you actually learn about their parentage, um, which is depressing for some of us. Um, what they act like, just like that image that Rochelle showed, this idea of a loner, does it by itself, can't talk to people like Big Bang Theory, only can talk in jargon, it's completely smug. Some of that's true, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I fall into a category sometimes. But also, what do they do? Like, I think when we're talking to undergrads and we're saying, like, I want to be a chemist or I want to be a geologist, the people they're talking to are their professors. So when they're, they're like, I need some advice on my career, they're like, well, you should go to grad school, and then you do a postdoc, and then become a professor. Because that's the selection of people you're talking to, right? So, you know, professor or they work in a lab. And another thing that is a huge misconception when we're talking about the stereotype is this idea of Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Like, he knows chemistry, he knows geology, he can make a time machine, he knows astronomy, he's an engineer, he's an inventor, he also knows medicine. Like, it's not the truth, right? That's not reality. So these, these are the things that I kind of want to take apart, and I'm going to do that in this presentation. And so, first of all, I'm going to talk about my story, because I can kind of talk about what they look like, where they come from, and just like, the lunch presentation, I take every part of me to work, and I, I don't, I'm unapologetic when I'm talking about who I am. And again, it took me a long time to be okay with that as well. I want to talk about my jobs because what I do is not in a lab. I am a professor, but I do not know all sciences. Um, and then the last, very bad, last bit, I'm going to talk about um, actually communication training because as scientists, we're, we're not formally trained to communicate. We don't really... Um, have confidence in doing that in a way that has been studied or how other professors really teach their students how to communicate. So I've been doing that at my university and creating classes so that we can do that. So we can train scientists. And again, I have like, please ask me questions through this. This is probably, this whole thing takes about 12 minutes, 13 minutes, so you can ask me questions as I go through. Okay, where they come from. So this is Taipei, 1950s, Los Angeles, California, 1950s. That's my dad. He's super cute there, not so much now. Um, <laughs> this is my mom. Uh, it's my grandfather, who I never actually met, but I knew my grandparents in LA a lot. I spent a lot of time with them. Um, I just really like that picture. I mean, it looks like they're like from the movies. It's actually taken in Hollywood. They went on a date, and they had like three children, and they finally got on a date, and they took that picture. So here are my parents. Um, I come from a uh, Mexican-American family. That's my dad's family. They've been here since the 1900s, maybe 1890s. You know, when you just walked across the border, that's where we came from. And then my mom is from Taiwan. Um, so she came over in her late, mid-20s. mid, mid -20s. And that one is me. The little Asian boy is me. Um, that's, that's what I used to be called. And uh, that's my sister in there. And uh, there's my family right there. That's my daughter and my super white husband. Um, it's okay. He's okay with that. You know, I, I call him that. Um, <laughs> but the reason I show these pictures, one, people love pictures. 
Um, I love pictures of myself. But the second, the third thing is that all of these people, every single one of them, not one of them is a scientist, except for me. So I think it's really important when we tell our students, like, you can be a scientist, if they keep on subconsciously or hearing people's stories that they come from scientists, that to be a scientist you have to know scientists and all that kind of stuff, it's not exactly the case. And um, this whole idea of like smart people make smart people and dumb people make dumb people and idiocracy, it's very dangerous to go down that road. I'm just warning you on that. Um, that's me. Um, I grew up in a town called Linden, Washington. It is a small, small town um, um, just south of the Canadian border in Washington State. The demographics, as you can see right here, 96.3% white and 5,700 people in that um, like year after that picture was taken. So um, my, what they look like, right? This is my background, I was low income, my parents were divorced, public schools, there wasn't really very much science, very, very low diversity. There used to be a, like a newsletter that would come out and it had all the people of color, all the students, and it'd be like four black kids, like 10 Asian kids, 26 Hispanic kids. Um, and it was just, I didn't know which one they picked for me. Um, when, I, when, when I went to school, at, actually at this school, this was the, the first day it opened, because it was a brand new school, they put me in ESL. I only speak English, I don't speak any other language. Asians don't all speak Asian. And um, my mom didn't teach me Chinese, my dad doesn't even know Spanish because he grew up in LA and that's very normal apparently. And uh, because of my mom's accent, they just put me in ESL. And I remember I was in the class and I was like, why am I here? And the teacher was like, I don't know. Like, and then she like, she like got me out of there after a couple days. Um, yeah, it was not a great place. My, my parents didn't go to college. So I'm coming from that place and I go 20 miles south to Western Washington University. This is where I teach now. And it was like utopia for me. Like I, I suddenly thought like, oh my God, there's somebody else who's like, kind of looks like me, they have black hair, you know? Um, and nobody's yelling slurs at me. It was like super awesome. And there were other nerds um, and there was research there for undergraduates because they didn't really have a graduate program. Um, it, was, it was just, it did lack diversity, but compared to that other place, it was great. Um, so that's where I went. I eventually went to San Diego State University because that's where my family is and went to Washington State University to get my graduate degrees. And I became an adjunct faculty member at Bellevue College. This is back in Washington State. And as I finished my PhD, um, I started doing more and more outreach work. I did a lot more outreach work at this community college in near Seattle. And I started realizing that um, I could do this at a much broader level, much bigger level at Western. So I've been non-tenure track. I don't know as, as if your students know what that means, but um, it's a contract job at, um, at Western Washington University for the last five years. So in my first couple years at Western, and actually my first day, I proposed that I should get paid for doing this inclusion work that I did, and I finally got it to happen within the, the second year that I was there. So, so what's my job? Half of my job is teaching. I teach physics courses, 300 level physics courses, 100 level physics courses, astronomy courses, and science communication courses that I created, and half of my job is this. <laughs> so, I created this position because I have been working with clubs a lot. So SACNIS, you've heard this word a lot. And if you don't know what that means, it is a national organization that promotes racial and ethnic inclusion in the sciences. And it started in the 70s with um, Chicano um, scientists and Native American scientists, but it has grown. I would help these um, clubs. I would also um, organize events. I would, um, this is the women in physics right here. This is women of color empowerment dinner that I was part of another youth program for girls in science, um, a giant mixer. Um, I helped create these workshops to help, I'm just gonna say very bluntly, well-meaning white people in science talk about race. We made these workshops where we have them uh, think about themselves culturally and then kind of talk about others, always self-reflection first and then what can we do. But I do all this, I talk, I talk about people with NSF grants. I'm basically an advisor for a lot of things. Um, and so I created this halftime job that kind of 
has done a lot of work just kind of being an advisor. I, I don't know what else to say because there's a lot of things. I do a lot of things. Um, but the small amount of outreach that I do is science communication. And I want to point out that science communication is basically inclusion work. But the good thing about that is that you're not in people's face and saying, like, we're talking about race, we're talking about inclusion. You just be like, hey, let's talk about science. Who's your audience? Oh, your audience is diverse? Oh, you know, like it's, a, it's an easy way to talk about inclusion without actually getting a lot of that really hostile resistance. Um, so what happened is I was approached by the, a local radio station, created the science talk show, and now it is being absorbed by Western that it's become somewhat successful. Um, so I also noticed that, um, again, training, we're not formally trained. There's two different classes I do, survey versus project. Um, and then last but not least, inclusion work in general, even if it's science communication, is really, really daunting and like stressful and energy taking, so you have to find your community. So I'm gonna talk about those two classes, but before I do that, is there any um, questions before I talk about those two classes I created? It's been like 12 minutes, so. <laughs> All right, cool. So again, this is the podcast. You can go to sparksciencenow.com. There's like 78 episodes that we've put out um, in the last three and a half years. I have a crew of students, and I treat them like my children. You can see I put them like up the stairs. And like, Let's take a family picture. I was super excited by this picture. Um, so some of the students receive credit, independent study credit, to work on the show. They work on audio. They write blogs. They do the social media. They pick one of those things, or they do all three of those things, depending on what they want to do. Some of them have taken my science communication classes, some of them haven't. Um, but basically they're using the, they're learning these skills that are, is not in the curriculum right now. Like it's basically this class and those, uh, these two classes and this pro project. There is something called the Planet Magazine, which is environmental science um, journalism. But um, because this is all science, we talk about much more and I don't really know anything about environmental science, so I kind of created this instead. Um, 497 is a, the upper level course that myself and another science communicator that you saw earlier, uh, Dr. Melissa Rice, she works for NASA and Western. We created this, um, this class to basically teach them a little bit about um, journalism, a little bit about things that um, may affect them in the future. I have a quick quote here about empathy. Again, I sneak in inclusion, because I'm like, you're gonna have to give a crap about what people think and how they feel, otherwise they're not gonna listen to you. So we talk about that a lot. But just the, like, there's a lot of words, and if you want all of this, I can give it to you later, but basically, this is the gist of the class. We talk about press releases, we show them, um, we, we talk about blogs and social media and how to deal with that. Uh, we teach them how to interview and how to be interviewed as a scientist, and what to look out for. Um, Communicating with elected officials, they write letters to Congress people. Um, they translate really like heady journals into popular science articles, and they also do some podcasting. Every single final project is published, or at least try they try to get it published somewhere. Um, the reason I'm talking about this today, and I think it's important, is because if you're at a university and you're a professor or you're a grad student and you want to become a professor and to do this stuff, it's super easy to do a class like this. You do not have to have all the knowledge. I utilize local science journalists. I utilize the press officer at our university. I utilize the studio, the TV studio that's at our school, and they just they want people to use it, so they help me and they help lecture um, kind of the important things that you need to know working on um, a crew like that. And I utilize a whole bunch of rental um, equipment rental from the university, so I don't have to buy anything for my students. There's no books. The students don't pay anything to be in this class other than the tuition. Um, this is the second class I created just this summer. I've been working on it for a while, but I eventually got to um, run it this summer. And it's a, instead of a survey class that you saw, it's a project class. They have six weeks to go from knowing nothing about video editing or storytelling to making a three, three minute clip at the end of six weeks. And it was amazing. Like um, four of those clips, four of the six, are on Spark Science Now right now, and they're really good. 
And um, there were three science majors and three non-science majors. And I paired them up so that their, um, their skills could complement each other. And they became like best friends, and it was like the cutest thing ever, but every single person had to make a video. And we had a film festival at the end to commemorate our six weeks, and it had like 30 people there at this film festival, and this was on a, like a dead summer campus, like no one was there, we got 30 people to show up and watch those videos. And it was just amazing. Um, so again, what were my resources? I had um, guest lecturers, and I didn't, like, I didn't waste anybody's time, meaning every single person that came to talk in my class were paid to talk about that stuff at university. Like they worked in the libraries or they worked in Student Technology Center. And I wasn't, um, what do I want to say? I wasn't um, taking advantage of people's time. So. All right, support system, I'll go through this really quickly. That's a really old picture from 1995 with my husband. Um, I'm old, uh, that's my baby. She likes that picture because it looks like her head's floating. <laughs> You can't really see these pictures really well, but like I have a, I get, have good support systems, and it's really important that you do that, otherwise you go insane. So, any questions? Or we can just move on to the next person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>